praise your name, Lord.
worship you. Jesus, we worship you. Praise Jesus, our great name. Praise your name. Praise your name. Praise your name, Jesus. 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 Oh, we worship you. Magnify you, Lord. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. Yeah. 
I worship you. I love you, Jesus. I magnify your name. Nothing in this world can truly satisfy, but your presence brings satisfaction. I glorify you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for the joy of the Lord that is a strength to us. Because, Father, depression is very real in this world, but depression is a lie. Depression is a feeling, it's a belief that a situation is not going to change, that there is not a satisfactory resolution to what we're facing. But yet, Jesus, your presence counteracts depression. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. There is nothing we can face that you cannot take us through. Nothing. Depression is a lie. But Father, your presence, your glory, your word, your joy, your peace, all of that is truth. And Jesus said, We'll know the truth, and the truth will make us free. So I thank you, Father, that from your perspective and your declaration, depression has no authority in our lives, and that we can walk free if we want. Your presence, Jesus, your presence is heaven to us. Your presence is resolution, your presence, your presence is deliverance. And I thank you for it. Father, in this place right now, today, and wherever people are watching, my prayer is that every single person will experience the reality of your presence. Experience it in a way that will produce a permanent change in our lives. And Jesus, we give you the glory for it, you paid an incredible price to make these things true. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And may God's will be done this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Guys, why don't you go ahead and get around and greet some people. Those of you watching, do the same. Well, good morning, good morning. Hello, Albuquerque. How you doing out there? We miss you, Cindy. We'll see you again. Don't know when. But uh, why don't you send some of that nice warm weather our direction? Anyway, good to see you guys. And wherever you happen to be watching this morning, thank you. Thank you for, for joining in, being a part of this. Um, the kids had a great party this past Wednesday night. Uh, you know, thank all of you who helped out in that. There's just one problem, and that is those the workers, those who helped out. You forgot to collect a tithe of the candy for me. <laughs> <laughs> Chocolate only. <laughs> anyway, now the kids had a good time, and uh, it, I, I just it was great. Thank you very much. Uh, we had the till we meet again party for Cindy, and a lot of you didn't have the opportunity to see the poetry that she's written over the years. Well, that is all laid out down in the fellowship hall. It's framed. And if you see one frame on top of another, it's because the two go together. You are welcome to go down there after the service, look over what is available, and take whatever you like. Maybe you see something that you think would be a blessing to someone. Go ahead and take it. 
and give it to that person, whatever. So I just wanted to let you know that uh, all of that poetry is still available. I know some of it was taken, but there's more down there. So please, you know, avail yourself of this and uh, it will be a blessing to you. We're going to give you an opportunity to bless the Lord in your giving today. You know, thank God for furnaces that work. Glory to God. Keeps us, you know, kind of warm. And um, anyway, you know, it'd be nice if the gas and electric companies would give us discounts <laughs> or just give it to us. But it doesn't work that way. I understand. So anyway, we uh, just praise God that we're able to keep the bills paid up to date. I, I know uh, a friend of mine many years ago in a particular denomination he was um, offered a church to pastor. And he, he was explaining the whole situation to me. And he said, you know, I asked the leadership of the denomination, is this church current on its bills? They said, oh, yeah, yeah, everything's fine. No problem. I said, well, all right. Now, this is like a one-hour drive, one way, for him to get there. So he got there, and it's winter time, and it's cold. Well, he gets there, and he finds out that the gas and the electric have been shut off <laughs> because the bills weren't paid. And he says, so, you know, Sunday mornings, you know, you couldn't have much of a service on Sunday nights because no electric, no lights. He said, there's no heat. So what we would do, we took a, <laughs> it was a small congregation, we took a kerosene heater and put it in the middle of a classroom and we all sat in a circle around the kerosene heater. And, uh, you know, we had our coats and everything on, and he said, and, and I'm, I'm, I've got the fingers, I think he was explaining fingers cut out of the gloves that he wore so that he could kind of try and play a guitar. They'd sing a few songs, and he'd do a little preaching. <laughs> he said that was it. He said it was one of the worst experiences of his life. Well, thank God uh, we don't need a kerosene heater. Thank you, Jesus. But I thank you guys for your giving, and I thank you for what you're doing in support of what God is doing here. And the same thing for those of you who are watching, thank you for sending in your offerings. It really helps, and it makes a huge difference. We appreciate that. So this morning, as you're getting ready, as you know, the envelopes are there in front of you. For those of you who are watching, you can send in an offering by way of PayPal. There's a link on the opening page of the website, and then also... The mailing address is there as well, and you can uh, send any checks or money orders, just make them out to GCC, and uh, that'll work out. So, as the ushers are coming forward, everybody please stand. Praise the Lord. Brother Sean, would you please pray over the offering today? Lord God, Father, we just thank you today. We just thank you for what you're doing in each of our lives in this ministry. Father, we just ask you to bless the offering and make it go forth and accomplish your will. And we just give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please go ahead and have a seat. In the, the rear of the sanctuary, there are shoe boxes. And these shoe boxes are going to be used to send presents to children in other countries. Now what we'd like you to do is to take one of the boxes. There's information in the box about the kind of things to buy and not to buy. And then uh, you can pick a boy or a girl, gifts for a boy or gifts for a girl, and the age, and then uh, tape a label onto the box and, and uh, fill the box <coughs> with those items. You know, you buy at the dollar store. You know, they don't have to be expensive things. You know, and pray over it. And then also there's an envelope there uh, with it. It costs $9 per box to ship it overseas. So if you could contribute to that shipping cost, uh, we'd really appreciate it. And bring the boxes back in no later than November 20th. That way we'll have plenty of time to get these shipped out. Uh, you know, sometimes it takes quite a while to get items shipped into other countries. 
If you have any questions about the shoebox project, please see Tabitha and she'll answer any of your questions. And, you know, maybe, maybe you don't want to go shopping. You know, you want to participate, but you just don't want to take the time to go shopping. Well, you can give Tabitha some money and then she'll go do the shopping for you. And maybe you would just like to, you know, I, I just want to pay for some of the shipping. Well, that's okay. You can do that too. But anyway, again, if you have any questions about this, please go ahead and talk to Tabitha and she'll have all the answers for you. And then, uh, you know, it's just amazing. We just don't know the impact this will make on children overseas. You know, they just don't have the things like what we have. So this truly is a blessing. It's an opportunity to be a blessing to a lot of people. Praise God. You know, a moment ago I was talking about a friend of mine who was pastoring a church where the, they hadn't paid the bills and uh, there's no gas, no electric, there's no heat. It reminds me of a car that I drove. It was a 1967 Pontiac Tempest. Man, I like that car. And uh, I thought I was a hot rod, even though it, the engine was a dog. I thought I was a hot rod. But the thing about that car, man, it just, it just wasn't right. And in the wintertime, if it was snowing outside and I turned the blower on for the heat, I don't know how it did this, but it pulled the snow in from outside and began blowing snow in the car. <laughs> I mean, it's bad enough when it's on the outside, <laughs> but when it's on the inside, you're trying to see. <laughs> that was tough. <laughs> yeah, I was, by the time I got rid of that car, I was glad to see it go. <laughs> so anyway, praise the Lord. Thank God for cars that work and, and heat in buildings in the middle of the winter. Would you please turn to 1 Peter? 1 Peter chapter 1. Going to walk through some verses here, and I'm going to be giving you uh, several words and definitions to try and bring some clarity to what we're going to read. In 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. We'll stop right there. This second verse is extremely powerful in the message that it is presenting. When we understand what this second verse is really talking about, it's going to dramatically impact our lives as Christians, especially if we accept what it's saying and then live by what it is saying. Now let's take a look at this. In this um, first verse, you, you know, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers. Now that word strangers, it comes from a Greek word, Peripedimos, and that's a compound word. Para means near or close, and then the word epidemos, which is also a compound word, which uh, epi meaning in or among, and demos means a people. So what this is talking about is a foreigner who has settled down, however briefly, next to or among the native people. So when he writes this and he says to the strangers that are scattered throughout, he's saying, you know, you're foreigners and you're, you're scattered throughout these regions to live with these people. Now, if you look, in, we're, we're going to keep coming back. It's First Peter chapter 1 here is our foundation. But look in chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And we'll stop right there. 
in verse 11, you see that where it says pilgrims? That is the same word, peripedemos. In other words, God is saying in this verse, I want you to understand how I see you and your life as my child, as a Christian. In, uh, and I'll, you can write these verses down, look them up later on. In John 8, verse 23, Jesus was talking uh, to religious leaders, and he said, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are, from, you, ye are of this world, I am not of this world. And then in John chapter 17, verse 16, when he is praying, and he's praying about those in the future, post-resurrection, who would accept him as Lord and Savior, he said, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. What makes this so critical is if we see ourselves as not of this world, then we will not see ourselves shackled by things of this world. Are you understanding this? Because the moment that we start declaring, well, I'll never get such and such. All right, let me say, all right, let me just give a clear, more clear example. I'll never get these bills paid, okay? Then what that means is you see yourself of this world and shackled by this world's system. But God is saying, you're not of this world. God is saying, I see you as a foreigner who has settled down for a brief period of time to live among the native people. Well, who are the native people? Everybody who's lost. If I'm not of this world, that means that my origin is from somewhere else. Now, I know this sounds kind of crazy. Well, maybe not to you, but to some people that would just sound, you know, weird. But I'm not the one who made this up. I'm not the one who wrote this. This is God. And God is saying, look, I want you to understand. I do not see you as being of that world where you're living. I don't see you that way. I see you as a pilgrim. I see you as a foreigner to that world. You're just there for a short period of time. And it's not going to last the way it is. You are not shackled by the system of the world. And you can define system of the world however you want to. You're not shackled by it. You, granted, I understand there are certain principles and so forth about existing on this planet, but he's saying you're not of this world. Okay. Remember when there was a storm? The disciples were in a boat. They're rowing. We're not going to make it. You know, things are looking bad. What did Jesus do? Remember, remember when he was walking on the water? Okay, about the only way that you can do that, if you're not shackled by the principles of this world when it comes to water. Does that make sense? So therefore, there is a way. Now, please, when you go home, don't, don't go looking for somebody's swimming pool. And say, excuse me, I, can I just borrow your pool for a couple of minutes? You know, I want to show you something. <laughs> then kabloosh. And then call me. It doesn't work. No. When there is a need, then you are no longer shackled by the physics of this world's water, and it's possible for you to walk on the water. Right. Well, that was Jesus. Uh, but that was also Peter, right? Uh, the guy that wrote this. Hey, what do you know? Jesus walked on the water, and then Peter says, if it's you, bid me come. Well, what's Jesus going to do? 
Say, no, nah, it's not really me. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's me. He said, if it's really you, bid me come. Jesus said, come. <laughs> Peter steps out of the boat and walks on the water. And how did he do that? Because a word originating from another realm created a pathway on that water for him to walk. Well, Brother Martin, I just don't understand all that. And that is part of the reasons why, part of the reason why, that we don't see our faith work the way that it is supposed to work. Because we see ourselves shackled by everything in this world, even though we speak something that is contrary to it. What I mean is, we know what to say, when to say it, because we've been in enough church services. And so we just repeat what we know we're supposed to say, but it's not coming out of here. It's not coming out of the heart. And yet God is saying, hey, I want you to get a hold of this. Pay attention to this. I do not see you as being of this world. I see you as being from above. You're just on an assignment down there. You're just there temporarily. Well, then in verse 2, he starts out and uses this word elect. Now, this is interesting because this word elect, it comes from the, the Greek word electos. It means to choose, select, or be chosen. Now, he's speaking about Christians, and he says, and we can put our, our own names in there, you know, we're, we are the strangers, we are the pilgrims. And as pilgrims, and as these strangers, we are selected. We are the elect. We have been chosen. Okay? But how have we been chosen? According to the foreknowledge of God. See this? Now, if you don't have a King James Version, I have no idea what you're reading. Because I didn't look this up in any other version. So I'll be preaching to you today from the right one. And it says, <laughs> elect, we are a elect. Well, what, what, why am I elect? You, you are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Now, this word foreknowledge, it's interesting. It comes from the Greek word prognosis, and it's spelled exactly the way it sounds, prognosis. And what it means is to know beforehand. Now that's important, to know beforehand. To know beforehand. And it says according to the foreknowledge of God. Not according to foreknowledge, but according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, what that means is that it's it's a knowledge that God had only because he is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I want to read something to you over um, in Isaiah, Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> God is speaking. He says, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. He can declare the beginning from the end. How does he do that? According to foreknowledge. According to him knowing beforehand. In... Um, in Romans chapter 8, in fact, go ahead and turn over there. Romans chapter 8. We'll come back to 1 Peter chapter 1 in just a moment. See, a lot of people, when they get into this verse here in uh, 1 Peter, they can read this, you know, according to the foreknowledge, and they, they start drifting over into the area of predestination. In other words, God has declared, okay, all you folks on this side of the church, you're, you're going to be born again. I don't care if you want to be born again or not. 
I have predestined you to salvation. I can fight against it all you want. Too bad. You're going to be saved. You folks over here, sorry, <laughs> but I have predestined you to burn forever in the lake of fire. Now, I don't care how many times you come to this altar and pray and cry out and call upon the name of the Lord. It's not going to work. I have predestined you to an eternity in hell. That doesn't even make sense. I mean, that, that sounds like God needs some therapy. <laughs> That's, but in Romans chapter 8, look at this. Verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he, Jesus, the son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, some people would say, well, right there it is, predestinate, I mean, that's it, there you go. No, no. For whom he did for no, he did predestinate. Now, what this is talking about, he knows the beginning from the end. Now, he knows if you're going to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He, he knows before you're born. He knows before you're conceived. If you're going to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he knows it because he knows the beginning from the end. How else do you think he could give the Apostle John the understanding for the book of Revelation, the, the final seven years? Because he foreknew it. He knows who will be born again, and he knows who won't. He knows who is going to accept Jesus, and he knows who won't. And so those he foreknows, he has a plan for them. The plan for those that he knows will accept Jesus as Savior is that, look at this, they will be conformed to the image of his son Jesus, who was the firstborn, the firstborn from what? The firstborn from the dead. In other words, he was the first one resurrected from spiritual death to life. The Bible says he was made to be our sin who knew no sin. He died because of our sin, not his own. But then God raised him to life because he was innocent. He was the firstborn. Well, you know, somebody was the second, somebody was the third, and so on. You're the 487 millionth or whatever the case would be. But he said, for all of you who are going to accept my son Jesus, let me put it like this. He says, here's the plan. Anybody who accepts my son Jesus, I have predestinated that you will conform to the image of my son. This is the plan. Now, what does that mean, conform to the image of his son? Well, what it means is the moment, well, you can read about it over in Ephesians, but it talks about how that the moment we get born again, you know, by faith, or, you know, by grace are you saved through faith. The moment that we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are risen together with him. And we are made new like him. Meaning, we didn't just get born again and stay the way we were before born again. When we got born again, God said, anybody who will accept my son Jesus Christ, my plan, my plan, predetermined plan for you is that the moment you get born again, you will conform to the image of my son who's seated here with me. That's the plan. In other words, I can't say that I am not holy. I can't say that I am not righteous. <clears throat> I cannot say that I'm anything other than what God has said. If God has said it about Jesus, he has said it about me. I just don't have a name that is, that is you know, above every name. But I have the right to use that name. 
Because he says so here in his word. And where he says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of, son, of his Son, that he, Jesus, might be the prototype for all who would accept him in the future. But, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, this passage, we don't have time to go into, you know, every word here. This isn't simply a matter, remember, God, Alpha, Omega, beginning, end, he knows all these things. This revelation, this principle, goes back before the cross to all the people, the, the, uh, the Hebrews chapter 11 people, who put their faith in God but could never be born again because there was no sacrifice offered for them to be born again. There was no Savior. But they still put their faith in God. You know, Abraham trusted God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. And then you see uh, Jesus, uh, he tells the story about the rich man and Lazarus and how Lazarus died and he was taken by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Well, that's a term uh, that we use and that makes reference to all those people who were separated from the torment of hell. They were in a place waiting for the day that the righteousness that had been laid to their account could be imparted to their nature. And when that happened, Jesus led captivity captive. So all those people who had been waiting all that time for the Redeemer to show up, he finally shows up, and when he does, think of it like this, there he is. He's paying the price in hell on his way out. He stops in to paradise, to Abraham's bosom. And he says, I'm here. I'm here. And I'm here to him. And that, he imparts that righteousness. He imparts that new nature to them. And then they are risen with him. And so they now exist. How do you think they got to heaven? See, you can't get there unless you've got the life and the nature of God. How did they get the life and nature of God? They did everything they could prior to Jesus, and God laid it to their account. David, Daniel, you know, Joshua, Moses, Abraham, Noah, you know, on and on the list goes. And then that day came, and so he says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he justified, and whom he justified, them he glorified. So there, there is a time coming for us when we will have a glorified body. But from a spiritual perspective, we have now been glorified as Jesus has been glorified, the risen Son of God. Are you understanding this? Now, if we go back to um, 1 Peter. See, this whole thing of, um, of the, the foreknowledge, it's not predestination. Okay, Leave your finger here in 1 Peter and turn over to Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation chapter 13, it's talking about, uh, you know, the, the beast and what we call the Antichrist, the false prophet and all this. And, and um, it's talking about how that, you know, the mark of the beast is going to be imposed on people, etc. and so forth. Well, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, meaning, you know, the, the Antichrist and so forth, the beast, false prophet, all, the, all those that dwell, all them that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. See, if you want to talk about predestination, then what this means is God predestined Adam to sin. Why in the world would he do that? Because, what, he, he selective predestination? Some are predestined, some aren't. Well, how do you know the difference? See what I'm getting at? So what happened was, God had a plan. And before he began creating this universe, 
foundation of the world, foundation of the cosmos. He had a plan to restore man because being Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, and having the foreknowledge of what would happen, he knew ahead of time that once he gave Adam and Eve free will, they were going to make the wrong choice. But he said, to compensate for that, even though I don't agree with it, I'm going to have a plan of redemption. And that plan of redemption is going to include my son, Jesus Christ, <clears throat> dying on the cross for their sins. That's why it talks about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So from God's alpha and omega position, he already saw this plan playing out and Jesus dying on the cross. So from his perspective, it was already finished in his realm. Now see, we, we have a hard time understanding that. That's because we're not God. We're not Alpha and Omega. We are, while we're living here in this world, you know, we are shackled, if you will, by the ticking of the clock. You understand what I mean by that? So we live within this, uh, Jesus was too, shackled by the ticking of the clock. But, so God knew this plan was set in motion. And then it was a matter of waiting for creation's time to pass to the point to where it reached the event, first of the crucifixion, second of the resurrection. The moment that happened, God was then able to impart righteousness to those who had righteousness laid to their account before Jesus, and then after the resurrection, everybody who called upon the name of the Lord could have that righteousness immediately imparted unto them. We call it being born again. Now looking back here in 1 Peter. See, God didn't know, no, God, God knew that Adam was going to sin before he did it, so he had that plan set up. And here in 1 Peter, where he says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. This word sanctification of the Spirit, was the word sanctification in the phrase sanctification of the Spirit, the word sanctification is the Greek word hagiosmos. It means to sanctify, sanctification unto holiness, sanctification unto separation unto God. A process which leads to a state of existence. Now that's really important. This word spirit, it's not talking about sanctification of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> He's already sanctified. <laughs> He's you know third person of the Godhead. It's talking about our spirit, our, our human spirit, if you will. Now, this aspect of sanctification, the moment that we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the sanctification process is initiated and completed in the blink of an eye. You can't measure it in our time. Because this sanctification process puts us in a position of being sanctified unto holiness. Which means we immediately come into a state of existence of being holy unto God. Um, over in Ephesians it talks about how that you, know, you need to put on the new man or live according to the new man. Which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So our existence now, the sanctification, see a lot of times, I remember years ago when I was in a denomination and uh, when you were going for like level two of their credentialing for ministry, one of the things they would ask you, you know, you're born again? Yeah. Feel the Holy Ghost? Yeah. Are you sanctified? Well, what they meant by that was, it's a process. In other words, you know, have you cleaned up your act? You know, are you sanctified? 
And uh, one guy sat there during the interview, and they asked him, are you sanctified? He said, nope. <laughs> he said, but I'm working on it. <laughs> the thing is, when you understand what this sanctification is, it is not a lengthy, drawn-out process that requires effort on my part. This sanctification of spirit is a sanctification of me on the inside. My pilgrim person, if you will. I have been sanctified as holy before God the moment that I was born again. But this, this statement here of it, a separation unto God, in the, in, a, in the grand scheme of things, this separation unto God it's not a matter of me saying, okay, I got to mortify the deeds of the flesh and, and I got to separate myself from, you know, drugs and alcohol and smoking and chewing and too much television and all that. No, no. This separation unto God is what happened when I was sanctified. Remember, I am a pilgrim. I'm not of this world. I am from above. My sanctification leading to separation unto God is talking about the moment that I was sanctified, I was separated from this world to become a person who's no longer of this world, but somebody who is from above. I've been separated unto God. Now, as we look at each other, I mean, we really can't tell that on the outside, but on the inside. See, this is God's perspective of us. We have to mortify the deeds of the flesh. I understand that, but I'm already sanctified unto separation unto God. I'm not waiting for that day to happen. That is my state of existence right now as a person who's accepted Jesus. And notice what he says here, sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, this is kind of King Jamesy. I understand that. <clears throat> and it probably could have been, um, the words maybe could have been rearranged for a little bit more clarification. But this word obedience, it's the Greek word hupakoe. It means to obey, hearken, listen, also, it means the subjection of a slave to a master. Now, let me say it like this. You are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. He knew ahead of time that you were going to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's why he has a plan for your life. You're going to be an apostle, probably evangelist, pastor, teacher, helps governments, whatever. He has a plan for your life already established. And it's not a matter of he has to come up with a plan. That plan already exists. And so you have been, I'll say it like this. Okay, you've been elected to be a pastor. And you've been elected or chosen to be an evangelist. And you've been, follow what I'm saying. But more than that, you have been, because God knew you were going to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he made a decision to select you. You are chosen to be his child. Now, he says you're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Another way to say, to say this would be your obedience to God and his explanation of what it takes to be sanctified resulted in you being sanctified. Said differently. Your obedience unto the gospel message of salvation is what led you to be sanctified. Now, if you leave your finger here in 1 Peter and turn back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
verse. You're going to see this written differently. It's the same message. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. The truth was you must be born again. The truth was you're lost without Jesus. The truth is you have no hope without accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So therefore, where he says, belief of the truth, I became obedient to that truth. See, the whole aspect of, of uh, the gospel message, as far as being born again, God is you know, he, he stands in heaven, we'll say, and he looks out across all of humanity and he says, okay, earth people, listen up. I say to you, through my son, you must be born again. See that? That's his instruction to all humanity. Well, I hear that. And I understand, okay, God is saying, I must be born again. Well, okay, how do I get born again? You have to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You have to call upon the name of the Lord and, and it, the whole process. So I hear this and I realize this is his instruction for all humanity. Then I make a decision to believe that and then to obey that instruction. And the moment I make that decision to obey that instruction, I am no longer living by my will. I am living by his will in that I, like a slave, subject myself to his instruction, you must be born again. And the moment I make myself subject to that instruction, he's my master I make my, a, myself a slave unto the order to be born again. The moment that happens, I'm born again. And how exactly does that take place? Well, back in 1 Peter, verse 2, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience, and notice this where it says, sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, you can go back and read these events later on. But in Exodus 24, it talks about Moses taking the blood of oxen and sprinkling it on the altar. Then when you get over to Leviticus chapter 8, it, um, as you read through the chapter, here's what you're going to find. Moses taking ram's blood and sprinkling that on the altar, but then he takes ram's blood and anointing oil. And he sprinkles the ram's blood on Aaron, Aaron's sons, and their garments. Then he takes the anointing oil and sprinkles it on Aaron, his sons, and their garments. What does that represent? What it represents is the blood of Jesus Christ sanctifying us from our sin and the process of being born again. And that oil, it represents after the blood has been applied, now you are a candidate for the anointing of the oil or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And so this, and, and the reason he sprinkled the, 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 uh, the blood on Aaron, his sons, and on their clothing is very symbolic. The clothing is on the outside. The people are on the inside. The sprinkling of the individual is a representation of being born again. The sprinkling of the blood on the clothing represents the individual by virtue of having been purged by the blood of Jesus can now take the power of that purging and apply it to the outer garment of the flesh to mortify the deeds of the flesh so that what we have on the outside does not dictate who we are on the inside. See this? 
Now here in Peter, look, look, um, look in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter, leave your finger here in 1 Peter. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, it says, <clears throat> Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. How is it that, what, what are we sprinkled with? It's that blood of Jesus. Now again, this is symbolism. And he's trying to get across to us that there's a change that has taken place. And God is trying to emphasize, you're not who you used to be. You can let the world and man's version of Christianity dictate to you who you are. But from my position as God and the Heavenly Father, I'm saying that stuff isn't true. I'm telling you, you're not of the world. You have been changed. You are totally different on the inside. And the reason you have a hard time relating to that is because this work has taken place in the realm of the spirit, not in the realm of your flesh, not in the realm of this natural world. I am a spirit. I am God and I am not clothed in flesh. I am not clothed in anything that is a part of that fallen world. You are not bound by the dictates of this world or of religion that does not acknowledge the fullness of who Jesus Christ is. I'm not bound to be controlled by that, but I have free will to yield to it if I want. Just like Adam yield, yielded to the lie of eating the fruit, you won't die. Now look here in this. <clears throat> Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. See that word obedience, it carries over into a post sprinkling existence because it means that we now have the spiritual potential to hear God and obey the fullness of his will in all areas of our life. Every, see, that's just like with the priest. Once he went through all that process, he then was able to function fully as a priest the way God dictated for a priest to operate. But if you didn't go through that process, well, sorry, but you know, you can't do that stuff. But once the priest had gone through that, <clears throat> he then was able to live according to the fullness of what God had, had declared, here's the way a priest is to live. Here's what he is, here are his responsibilities. Okay, see that type and shadow now exists for us because in Revelation it talks about that we've been made kings and priests unto God. So we've gone through this process and now we have the, the spiritual potential because of who we become on the inside. We have the spiritual potential to not only hear what God has to say, but we also have the potential to be fully obedient to everything he says do. Doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. If he says do it, that means we have the potential to do it. But all too often, if we find out what God's will is, our tendency is to take a look at the things of this world and evaluate the possibility of full compliance to his instructions. You see what I'm saying? And he says, no, you're a pilgrim. <laughs> you can do this because you're not of this world. And if I tell you to do something, you can do it. It's not a question of, of, well, maybe I can, maybe I can't. God is saying, look, you can do it. You can do everything I tell you to do. Everything. Now let me summarize 
In fact, turn over to 1 John. 1 John, chapter 4. 1 John, chapter 4. We're going to read this a uh, few verses here in just a moment. But what I'm going to do is give you one way to summarize everything that we just read out of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God sees us, those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. God sees us as temporary visitors living among a dying race on a doomed planet. We are his offspring. We are a generation chosen by him. There, there is no generation before us, and there is no generation after us. You say, well, yeah, but some of these people, they lived you know, a thousand years ago. No, nope. from God's perspective. There is one generation. There are no such things as grandfathers in the spirit. See this? Now, I know the symbolism, you know, fathers of the faith and so on and so forth. But from God's perspective, the people 2,000 years ago who believed in Jesus, as soon as he was resurrected, and the people today, and the people, you know, however long it's going to be before Jesus comes back, everybody who's born again, we are all on an equal plane. There's one generation. That's it. They're, they're, uh, humanly, of this world, there are previous generations. But from his perspective, that's it. One generation generation. And so we're his offspring. We are that generation chosen by him. Our spirit has been fully and completely sanctified. This sanctification results in a spirit that is alive with the life and holiness of an omnipotent God and is immeasurably more powerful than the vessel of fallen flesh wherein we temporarily live. In other words, the flesh has, from God's perspective, it has no ability to control us. We have to yield to its desires. But from God's perspective, no. Greater is he, my life in you. But you don't have to give in if you don't want to. Along with that, we now have the ability to hear his voice in our sanctified spirit on a supernatural frequency that is totally foreign to the normal inhabitants of this planet. We can not only hear him, but can also engage in conversations with him on this frequency. As he gives us instructions, we are capable of full obedience to all he requests and can now do things the dying species of this planet would think to be foolish. If it's you, bid me come. <laughs> Peter, are you stupid? You can't walk on water. What's the matter with you? Follow what I'm saying? The world says it's absolutely stupid to take a step of faith. And it's funny. The world uses that word faith. The world uses that word trust. But they use it relative to what they see in this fallen world. When we use that word faith, it's not supposed to have anything to do with what can be accomplished in this world, by this world, the way of this world. It's supposed to be totally related to the things of God and nothing else. When we submit to his anointing of oil, which is symbolic of allowing the Holy Spirit to fill us, we receive a power none of the normal planetary inhabitants possess. We are then able to do great exploits none of the normal planetary residents can explain. They often will refute or denounce or, or call these things evil that we do. And this is because the resident species on this dying planet does not understand our superpowers or their source. You say, that is the goofiest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> then you need to talk to God about it. Because Jesus Christ himself said, you shall receive what's that next word? Power. Power. After that, the 
Holy Ghost, third person of the Godhead comes upon you. That means this power only comes from one source, and that is Almighty God. That means compared to this world, it is a superpower. We ought to have uniforms, SC, super Christian. Now see, when you put it in this kind of terminology, immediately people kind of get, you know, goofy in the head trying to understand this. But this is what God sees. When Jesus was operating, was he not operating with superpowers? Sure he was. And then we sit back and we say things like, well, you know, I have a Jesus. Didn't Jesus say, look, if you believe in me, the works I do, you shall do also. Well, how are you gonna, how, how's that, Jesus? Because you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. God sees us in this world as the superheroes. We're the ones that those movies are talking about. <laughs> you understand what I'm getting at? That's us from God's perspective. That's why he said, these signs shall follow them that believe. One of the things we're supposed to be doing is laying hands on the sick, and they are going to recover. The world says you can't do that. Doctors will tell you, you can't do that. But God says you can. God says you can. We're pilgrims. We are here temporarily on assignment. The Apostle Paul, you know, he talked about, I'm kind of torn between two, whether to stay here for you folks or, or just to go on and be with the Lord. But you know, I've come to a conclusion that it's really going to be more beneficial for me to stay here with you. You know what? It's more beneficial for us to stay here. It's more beneficial for you, for us to stay here, and for the world. See what I'm saying? That's why Christians that have the attitude of, well, I just want to quit. I just want to give up. I just can't take anymore. You don't know who you are. <laughs> You're not human. You're superhuman. <laughs> you are not of this world. <laughs> There's nothing in here that says, Life's going to be easy for the believer. But there's a whole lot in here that tells us answers are available to the believer. God is available to the believer. Here in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth us not. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. See, you and I can sit down and we can have a conversation about these things. We can have a pilgrim conversation. And the people of the world have no idea what we're talking about. Because they're not a part. They're not pilgrims. They're not strangers. See, God says, you're strangers in that world. And the world says, yeah, you're strange. <laughs> we agree with, with this. You're strange. You're strange. Well, you know what? You start getting the people of the world healed, they don't care how strange you are. They're going to want to know. How did you do that? Remember? You know, Paul, and I forget who all was, Silas, whoever, they're with him, and they get this person healed. And, uh, and I forget the when and the where and the chapter and the verse and all that. But they start worshiping, you know, oh, you are great, you are wonderful. <laughs> They said, no, 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 we didn't do, it's not us. This power comes from God. But they realized there was something different. God wants us to come to this place of fully understanding we're not of this world. We're in it. <laughs> we don't like everything that goes on. But we're not of this world. In, in the Bible, he gives us 
instructions about how we're supposed to live here in this world. Not just, you know, praying and, and uh, you know, meditating in Scripture and, and praying for people and all that, but also how we're supposed to have respect for the species that is resident on this planet. You understand what? Especially those in leadership. You know, he's got instructions in here about this. But we're not of this world. We are of God. If we've truly accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Praise the Lord. Guys, we need to capture the fullness of this revelation. It's something that the more we spend time in God's presence and asking, help me grasp this because it sounds so foreign. Help me understand because at times I feel like I'm totally of this world. Help me understand what you see. And he will. He will. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. If it weren't necessary for me to seek after this understanding, he wouldn't, throughout the New Testament, talk about pressing into. So therefore, I need to do it. And he's going to show me. The Apostle Paul, he came to a place of understanding this. Others came to a place of Peter. He understood this. Okay, that means we can too. Every single one of us. We can come to this place of understanding. Okay, you know what? I look like everybody else down here. And yeah, this body is decaying. But oh, if you could see on the inside, hallelujah, I am not of this world. I am sanctified, holy, and righteous, and separated unto God, and the glory of that resurrection life lives in me. Amen. Praise the Lord. Please stand. Now, there might be people out there watching this, and, you know, maybe you've never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Uh, there might be people in here. Well, see, you have to make that decision. You might say, well, yeah, but God already knows who will and who won't. That's right. Well, why don't you become one of the wills? <laughs> Man, I, he hasn't given me that revelation. That means the door is still open. Don't, don't get caught up in this, well, if God wants me saved, then, you know, someday that'll happen. Nope. Right now, this day, this is the day of salvation. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this is your opportunity. And it's so easy because the moment you do, that change takes place on the inside. And you have that potential to live the way that God wants you to live. That change is real. So right now, everybody here, just please go ahead and bow your heads. And those of you watching, um, you, know, you can bow your head if you want to. But... I'm going to lead in a prayer, and it's a prayer to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to be born again, to receive this life that he is offering, and to become one of those pilgrims that he's described in Scripture. And if that's you, and you want this life that he's offering, just repeat this prayer after me. And those of you who are born again, if you want to pray this in support of them, uh, you can do that as well. So just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus... I am a sinner. I cannot change myself. You are my only hope. So right now, Lord Jesus, I invite you into my life. Remove from me that old sin nature. Purge me of that evil conscience. And give unto me that born again life that sanctified spirit that you've promised in your word. I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I receive you now. And I ask you to give unto me every one of your gifts you know I need. I receive them from you and I will operate in them. And I thank you for this. And I ask you to help me from this day forward to live the way God desires. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, those of you that are watching, you know, if you prayed that right now to accept Jesus, just use the contact us form there at the website and send an email and, 
you know, that way I'll be able to pray for you because I'll know that this transformation has taken place in your life. And uh, anybody here, you know, if you just prayed for the first time to receive Jesus, just let me know before you go. I'll be able to keep praying for you as well. Remember this, God has promised that by Jesus' stripes we were healed. That is a living reality for all of us pilgrims. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, that our healing is manifested in our bodies. By faith, we call it so. Will you guys have a blessed remainder of this afternoon? And just let God prepare your heart and mind for what he wants to do in tonight's service. And we'll see you then.